Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode, I believe it's 69 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, this is for the week of August, uh, what is it, August 16th to 22nd, 2012. Uh, I'm your host. My name's Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me, I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, if you have any comments, questions, praise, criticism, any, hey, this is a kind of cool thing you should know about, anything like that, uh, you can contact me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And since I never expect you're going to catch that on the fly like that, uh, as I always say, you can check my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be up around here a couple of times during the show. And uh, you can go to the website and get the email address directly from there. As always, I do answer my email. Uh, I'm sometimes a little slow about it. Uh, I do answer my email, though. Just do me one favor. Seriously, if you send me email, please include something in the subject line like um, uh, your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that so I know it's not spam, of which I get way too much. All right, so I've got... Uh, Several things to cover today, about four or five things I want to get through, and uh, again, as happens frustratingly often, I'm not going to get to everything I wanted to get to, but, uh, well, I'm going to do what I got. So I want to start, as I always like to be able to start, with some good news. Uh, I talked about this before, it was about, actually about eight weeks ago, uh, it was back in June it was. Uh, I was reporting on the good news that the state of Rhode Island had just passed a homeless bill of rights. It was the nation's first homeless bill of rights. As part of that, I mentioned how, um, uh, well, I'm going to quote myself here. This simple and humane legislation actually flies in the face of a trend in U.S. cities to criminalize homelessness and things associated with homelessness. Things like panhandling, sleeping outdoors, uh, getting fed in a public place, things like that. Now, toward that end, more than 50 cities in the United States have adopted laws about you know, anti-camping or anti-food sharing laws. Bluntly put, these cities are not trying to address the problems of homelessness or of the homeless. They're trying to make them invisible, simply trying to drive them out of sight so that the tourists and the rich corporate executives don't have to get grossed out by the sight of icky people like homeless people. Um, there's one example of these sorts of laws. I noted, again, and when I was talking about it before, in Philadelphia, an ordinance took effect on June 1st under which even recognized charities could not even feed homeless people in public places like parks. Well, there is some good news on that front. On Wednesday, uh, August 13th, uh, I'm sorry, Monday rather, August 13th, Federal District Court Judge William Yon, or Yon, uh, issued a ruling blocking that Philadelphia law. In Yon's words, quoting him, it hardly needs to be said that plaintiff's food sharing uh, programs benefit the public interest. Despite the city's considerable efforts, many Philadelphians remain homeless and hungry. Now, in a hilarious attempt to defend the law, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter, and that yes, that's his real name, uh, he said the intention of the law was actually just to get homeless people inside where they could have other help. <laughs> exactly why feeding people in a park prevents those same people from later on going inside somewhere. Um, well, that went unexplained. Uh, not surprisingly, the appropriately named Nutter administration has appealed uh, Jan's ruling. Now, there is a footnote to this, a footnote, a footnote, good news footnote to the good news. One of the four charities that sued Philadelphia over the ban is a religious charity called Chosen 300. Now, that group continued feeding the homeless while this thing was in legal limbo and, in fact, said that they never had any intention of obeying this ban. Uh, Reverend Brian Jenkins, he's the head of Chosen 300 Ministries, he said back in July, we're going to break the law. In the city's view, we're breaking the law. In our view, it's the command of Christ to feed the poor and the hungry. It is nice to know that there are still some Christians who actually know what it means to be a Christian. All right, from there we're going to move on to uh, our uh, what's become a regular weekly feature, uh, the, uh, the Clarabelle Award. 
Uh, the Clarabella Award given for acts of meritorious stupidity. This is about Allen, Texas. This is a suburb of Dallas. Now, not that long ago, Allen, Texas was a small farming community, but over the last 10 years, it's developed into a, a, a site of high-end retail shops and entertainment. Its population has doubled to 84,000, and its median income has gone up to a hefty $85,000. And like way too many places in Texas, they love them some high school football. Uh, in fact, many Texans, if you press them, they'll admit that high school football is almost like a religion in Texas. And so the city of Allen, Texas, is about to open a brand new $60 million high school football stadium. It'll have 18,000 seats, natural grass matrix turf, a 75 by 45 foot HD video scoreboard, a customized weight room, a press room, and private boxes that rival those of college stadiums. It's being built in large part because it was felt that the old stadium, which held a mere 14,000 people, simply wasn't big enough. This was funded out of a $119 million, $119 million bond issue that was approved by 63% of voters three years ago. The head football coach at the high school in Allen, a guy named Tim Westerberg, uh, Tom Westerberg, said, it shows that the people of Allen support their kids. I think it shows something else entirely. Because what's more, Christian Herr, this is an architect who worked on the program, he says as the result of this, other towns are going to be jealous of Allen. They're going to want their own bigger high school stadiums. This comes at a time when Texas state lawmakers have cut state education aid by $4 billion. By the 2011-2012 school year, the one just completed, uh, Allen, Texas was facing a $4.5 million budget shortfall that forced them to cut 44 teaching positions and 40 support positions. Now, in fairness, in fairness, the budget for the school operations and for the stadium construction were separate. And um, last fall, residents of Allen voted to raise local property taxes in order to make up for the shortfall in state aid. So good for them on that. But at a time when the state government is cutting aid to education, when you're having to raise your local taxes to keep from losing 84 teaching and support positions in your high school, at a time when Texas ranks 47th among states in SAT scores, and yes, I know all the problems with SAT scores, I probably know them better than you do. But the fact is, they still provide some basis for comparison. And Texas ranks 47th among states in SAT scores. At a time all this is happening, for you to be spending $60 million on an 18,000-seat high school football stadium because the stadium you already had with a mere 14,000 seats wasn't big enough. Look, the people, of Allen, the people of Allen, Texas, in fact, to all of you people in Texas who rank high school football above a high school education, you are clowns. Okay, uh, we're going to go on then to uh, our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. And this week, the target of the outrage is the Justice Department. Last week, August 9th, the Justice Department announced that after a careful review, it would not be prosecuting Goldman Sachs or any of its employees for any financial fraud, saying there is no basis for a prosecution. This is despite the revelations of a congressional report that was jointly released by Senators Carl Levin and Tom Coburn in 2011. This is the result of a two-year investigation by the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. That report singled out Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank as examples of Wall Street firms that reaped huge profits by marketing toxic securities to their, uh, to their clients as like AAA investments. While at the same time, those same banks were betting against those same securities. That is, they were taking out insurance such that if the securities folded, they'd be able to collect on the insurance, which, by the way, they did not tell their clients. 
The charges in the congressional report were based on thousands of internal company emails, internal company documents, on hundreds of interviews and on congressional testimony. Emails showed that even as the banks were pushing the securities as these wonderful safe investments, internally they were calling these same offerings things like junk, crap, and flying pig. In fact, there was that notable moment in the uh, congressional hearings when Carl Levin persistently quoted one Goldman Sachs email that described one such deal as shitty. What's even more, Goldman had already agreed to pay $550 million to end a civil fraud suit filed by the SEC. Um, a suit which, again, involved Goldman deceiving clients about the actual worth of the securities and other investments they were pushing on them. But none of that was good enough for the Justice Department. Nope, not good enough. Nope, nothing there. Now, something to note here is what the Justice Department was actually saying, in fact, is that there wasn't enough in that congressional report for a prosecution which means the Department of Justice is also saying that it is not going to investigate on its own. The, the DOJ has said, in essence, they simply are not going to investigate financial fraud by the big banks. Now, the agency did rather grandly allow as to how it would take another look if new information came to light which, in other words, means that if someone else goes to the expense and the effort of actually doing the investigation and then drops in the DOJ's lap an airtight case with such a loud plop that they can't ignore it, then they'll think about prosecuting this. Now, all this might not be as much of a surprise as you might think it is. Here's why. Do you know what company was the source, uh, the, the, the second biggest source of private contributions to the 2008 Obama for President campaign? It was Goldman Sachs. J.P. Morgan Chase was the sixth largest. Citigroup was the seventh largest. Like they said in Watergate, follow the money. Beginning of last week, Beginning of last week, uh, on August 6th, uh, a New York jury acquitted a former mid-level Citigroup official of financial fraud. The jury felt that the government hadn't proved this particular guy's guilt and actually believed he was being made a scapegoat for the entire financial industry. In fact, they concluded that the crooked deal that he was accused of putting together, that he actually did that deal the way his bosses told him to do it. Uh, and, and the jury wondered, and this is the key thing here, why this guy was on trial and not the CEO of Citigroup, whose behavior was, in the words of the jury foreman, appalling. In fact, the jury felt this so strongly, they were so concerned that the acquittal would send the wrong message, as they said, that they took the highly unusual step of issuing a statement along with the verdict. According to the jury's foreman, his name is uh, uh, Bo Brendler, he said, I'm quoting him, we were afraid that we would send a message to Wall Street that a jury made up of regular American folks could not understand their complicated transactions and so they could get away with their outrageous conduct. We also did not want to discourage the government from investigating and prosecuting financial crimes. So they released a statement which was read in open court by the judge. It said, this verdict should not deter the SEC from continuing to investigate the financial industry, review current regulations, and modify existing regulations as necessary. Brendley said it wasn't particularly eloquent as a statement, but he hoped it got the point across. Well, yeah, hopefully. Because the thing is, the American people know how crooked Wall Street is. We know how we have been screwed over again and again and again, and how we will be screwed over again and again and again, until and unless this is stopped one way or another. And we know that there have been no criminal prosecutions of any banks or bank executives as the result of the massive fraud 
that they committed and the massive pain they put on us in the terms of our lost jobs, our lost homes, and our lost futures. The problem we now face is that the people who are in a position to do something about this, they know this too. And they just don't care. And that is an outrage. And we are going to take a break. And we're back. Uh, now, for the next several minutes, uh, something, it's something I've talked about before, and I'm sure, frankly, I'll be talking about it again. Um, I've talked before about what I call attacks on what I call the commons. This is the idea that we as a people, as a society, um, have a community of shared interest and mutual responsibilities with everyone having responsibilities to each other. Uh, and the fact that there are people who are attacking that very idea of a community because they regard it as in their own selfish, greed-driven interest to not have to care about anyone else. Uh, one of the forms that these attacks have taken are these voter ID laws. I've talked about it before, I'm going to talk about it again. Particularly in this case, uh, the photo ID laws. These laws are an attack on the right to vote. Uh, they have disproportionate impact, in fact, on the ability to vote among the poor, minorities, students, and the elderly. Uh, these are four groups that, when they do uh, vote, well, at least three of them were, were clearly lean to the liberal side of things, and the fourth, the elderly, well, you know, things like Medicare and Social Security, they're going to be to the liberal side as well. In other words, these laws are an attempt to prevent people who might be liberal from voting and sort of create a voting landscape that is permanently tilted in favor of the right wing. That is, there is an organized effort by the right wing to permanently undermine our democracy and turn it even to more of a facade than it already is. Now, if that charge seems a little bit overheated, consider, just consider the facts. First, there is the simple fact that, um, in fact, it's so undeniable that uh, supporters of these laws don't even bother trying to deny it. The simple fact that these laws do have greater impact on, again, the poor minorities, uh, the elderly, and students. Uh, there are multiple studies, all of which conclude the same thing. Then there's the equally simple fact, which is equally rationally undeniable, but which the rabid right does, in fact, deny that the supposed problem that these laws address, in-person voter fraud, does not actually exist. In-person voter fraud means somebody showing up at the polls, pretending to be somebody else, and voting in their name. That's the only type of, of claimed voter fraud that these laws would actually address. And that type of fraud is as close to non-existent as you can, uh, you can possibly get. Again, there's a lot of studies on this, but I'm just going to quote the latest one. It's brand new. Uh, it came out on Monday, August 13th. It was done by an outfit called News 21. This is a nonpartisan investigative news project that is funded by the Carnegie and Knight Foundations. Researchers for this, they filed 2,000 public records requests across all 50 states, uh, reviewed nearly 5,000 court documents, records, and media reports. They found in this whole pile 2,068 alleged cases of voter fraud of all sorts since the year 2000, a period during which there have been more than 600 million votes cast in presidential elections alone. The study described that amount of fraud as infinitesimal. In fact, uh, 2,068 cases in 600 million votes works out to a rate of 0.0034%. That is a bit over three one thousandths of one percent. And the number of cases of actual in-person fraud? Ten. Ten out of over 600 million. That is a rate of, and I'm going to read this, 0.0000017%, just under two millionths of one percent, infinitesimal indeed. Now, 
News 21 also looked at the list. The, 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 national, uh, uh, the Republican National Lawyers Association came up with this list. Oh, voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. They came up with this list of 375 cases of voter fraud. Well, uh, News 21 looked at that list and discovered that most of these cases were just newspaper accounts of alleged fraud. Uh, they could only find in this list 77 cases of alleged fraud by voters, only 33 of which led to convictions, and not one of those 77 had anything to do with in-person voter fraud. The Gopper list was crap. In fact, voter fraud is such a myth that when cornered, even the reactionaries will admit to it. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is one of 10 states that has a restrictive voter photo ID law. The others are Alabama, Georgia, Indiana, Kansas, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin. Now, Pennsylvania has been sued over this law. The case was heard in July, and the decision is expected shortly. The thing is, before the trial began, in a stipulation agreement, Pennsylvania acknowledged that, quoting, there have been no investigations or prosecutions of in-person voter fraud in Pennsylvania, and the parties do not have direct personal knowledge of any such investigations or prosecutions in other states. Additionally to that, Pennsylvania said it will not offer any evidence in this action that in-person voter fraud has in fact occurred in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, and in fact they would not even argue that in-person voter fraud is likely to occur in November 2012 if the law is not in effect. Even before the hearing started, Pennsylvania admitted the claim basis, the whole claim purpose of the law is bogus. But they want to have the law anyway. Why? Well, one argument was advanced by Bill Denny, a state representative in Mississippi. He sponsored a state's voter ID bill, and he said, whether you have proof of it or not, what in heavens is wrong with showing ID at the polls? Well, here's what's wrong. About 11% of eligible voters, that's more than 21 million people, do not have a current, unexpired, government-issued photo ID. And, no surprise, seniors, the poor, and minorities are overrepresented in that group. Uh, in Pennsylvania, state election officials report that over 758,000 registered voters in Pennsylvania, that's over 9% of the entire voter base in Pennsylvania, do not have photo ID cards from the state transportation department. Now the governor's office insists that that, that number is actually way out of bounds and that you know, most of these people actually have other forms of acceptable ID. But even if the actual number of people without ID is half that many, a third that many, a quarter that many, a tenth that many, it would still mean that over 75,000 people would be wrongly denied their right to vote in order to prevent a crime the state of Pennsylvania has admitted does not exist. According to a new study released just a few weeks ago from the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law, now the Brennan Center, they study these things. A half million Americans in the 10 states with, with photo ID laws face serious challenges to obtaining the documentation necessary to get the, 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 the IDs. And again, it's the poor who are most affected. Now, legal, legal precedent requires these states to offer free photo IDs uh, to eligible voters who don't have one. But the fact is, a large number of these eligible voters face real hurdles in getting that free photo ID. There are problems of distance, problems of lack of transportation, problems of the money needed to get the documents in order to get the, it's actually not free then, is it, photo ID. The limited hours of many offices that issue the IDs. This November, states with restrictive voter IDs will provide 127 electoral votes. That's nearly half the total needed to win. Disenfranchising a large number of eligible citizens with these kind of laws could have a major influence on the outcome of the race. But it even goes beyond that. I just mentioned something about the limited hours of the offices issuing the IDs. A ridiculous example of that is uh, in Sauk City, Wisconsin, Wisconsin being Governor Walk All Over You State. Wisconsin, uh, in Sauk City, Wisconsin, this office is open on the fifth Wednesday of the month. 
There's only four, four months in all of 2012 that have a fifth Wednesday. This office for the free IDs is open four days in the entire year. And that's another example of the way that the, the reactionaries are trying to make it harder and harder for other people to vote, the undesirable sorts. You pretend to follow the rules, you pretend to be fair, but just throw up as many roadblocks and inconveniences as you can get away with. It's, and it's not just about getting ID. Even if you have ID, even if you live in a state without a restrictive ID law, you can still find problems. Consider Ohio. In 2008, there were these, uh, they, they instituted uh, um, early voting because in 2004, they had lines of like people like eight and nine hours waiting to vote. So they instituted early voting. Um, now, minorities who went heavily for Obama over McCain and were likely to do the same for Obama over Romney, they, um, they disproportionately took advantage of early voting. So this year, early voting has been cut back, and individual counties are now deciding whether to allow extended hours for early voting. And isn't it just by the most amazing coincidence that in heavily Democratic counties, early voting is only from 8 to 5 on weekdays, while in heavily Republican uh, uh, counties, it's also evenings and even weekends. Bottom line, these laws are not about preventing voter fraud. And if they're not, which they're not, and if they're not about protecting the integrity of the vote, which they're not, what are they about? Well, Mark Tarzai, uh, he's the majority leader of the Pennsylvania House, he told us in June, speaking at a Republican state committee meeting, he said that the ID law in Pennsylvania is going to allow Governor Romney to win the state of Pennsylvania. That's what these laws are about. It is a coordinated campaign to advance the power of the right wing, to cement their power and enshrine their greed and their indifference to the needs of others. And they're doing this by undermining the basic human right to vote. This is despicable, and don't you ever forget it. All right, one last thing. I think I got about a minute and a half, I think I got. Um, we're going to go to, and another thing, our occasional feature of things that are not really political, but just for the fun of it. And I just have time for this. Every year, Merriam-Webster's uh, Collegiate Dictionary adds about 100 new words to the dictionary. And the company has just released 25 of the 100 new words for 2012. And I just thought, just, just interesting what they are. There's 21 new words or phrases and four new definitions for existing words. The new, the new ones, aha moment, brain cramp, bucket list, cloud computing, copernicium, which is a new element, craft beer, e-reader, energy drink, f-bomb, flexitarian, which is somebody who's eats a little bit of meat, game changer, gastropub, geocaching, life coach, man, man cave, mashup, obesogenic, sexting, shovel ready, systemic risk, and tipping point. And the four new definitions are for earworm, gassed, toxic, and underwater. All right, that's it for me. I'm out of time. I will see you next week. You have the best week you can, and we'll check us back next week. Bye.